Yo, yo, yo. We're back again. I'm back with uh, Hunter's Point legend. I'm back with the San Francisco legend. I'm down with, uh, I'm back with a California legend, a West Coast legend, whatever you want to call him. He is a legend in the hip hop industry. He is one third of the RBL posse, Mr. Black C. Going on, What's my guy. All right, just man. living. That's all, you know. Man, I'm glad you came through, man. You know, like I said, you know, I try to bring. A, I'm trying to bring a message of faith right now to everybody. I'm trying to, you know, I'm just trying to get this message out. You know. Right, right. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I pre like I said, I appreciate you uh, emptying your busy schedule with you. I know you got a new album come out. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll, we'll kind of discuss that, but the first thing I want to kind of discuss with you is uh, the start of RBO. How did RBO get started? Because I remember when I was a young kid, and I just remember that they was like, "Man, there's this group coming out from HP. There's this group coming out. Man, they 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 got this. They got uh, jazz, and they they they." Uh, they they got the song with Prince on it. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they they flipped the Prince, and that was back before Kanye. You know, back in the day. They, right. They, so you know, I I remember that. So how did how did how did RBO get started? What what is R, first of all? What does RBO stand for? RBO stands for Ruthless by Law, which was given to me by my boy uh, T Lo. Uh, he was actually the dude that brought Mr. C to me. And um, he was actually the, one of the reasons, too, why RBO got started. Uh, T, uh, T. Lowe was uh, one of the rappers that was in the studio when uh, my boy Budweiser had me get equipment. I had just, I had just got out of Law Cabin uh, Juvenile Detention Center back in 89. I had just got off the ranch. And, um, you know, I was just trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what to do. And Budweiser came up to me and told me to invest in him. He was doing uh, gospel rap at the time. And um, he was going around to different churches. And he had uh, this song called In Hell, In Hell, Big City of Fire. And, uh, yeah, him and uh, three of my friends, used to, uh, Jerry and Quindell, they used to go to churches, like do a little church tour, doing this uh, single that he had, the In Hell, In Hell, Big City of Fire. And, he just wanted me to invest into him and um I ended up buying the equipment. He was he was pretty dope. I bought the equipment, um, went to the pawn shop, got the stuff. As I'm tinkering with the stuff, helping him with music, uh T Lo ended up coming in there and uh my brother, they started freestyling and making songs. And Budweiser ended up switching up. He seen the notoriety they was getting and he ended up kind of switching from doing the gospel rap to kind of going against uh this guy out of Sunnydale called the Miller. And okay. um they had a little battle. That's how he got his name, Budweiser. He was like, okay, his name is the Miller, but he really wasn't talking about the bill the the beer. His actually his name was like Millard or something like that. But we we all assumed his name was the Miller, like the, the beer. So Budweiser yeah. like, you know, I'm gonna go against him. My name gonna be Budweiser, you know, and uh that's pretty much how I ended up getting into the music. And then from there, I was making, I, I started learning the equipment, making the beats. And um, I, I, I actually kind of like, I, I just started getting a little bit like uh, impatient with them not coming in the studio, have new beats done. And they act like, you know, they was too busy. They was outside hustling. They was doing this, doing that. And I started rapping myself and made a couple songs. And I made this song called What About My Niggas? And it was a, uh, Basically, me naming everybody on my blog. I got that concept from uh, Too Short. Too yeah. Short uh, always said, man, if you mention dudes in the song, they're going to want to play it. So I mentioned the whole turf. So they, they everybody want to play the song. They all uh, drive off, going different places, messing with girls, and they'll play the song. And that was pretty much my start. That song, What About My Niggas? And that went on to me making uh, Don't Give Me No Bammer Joint. We Don't Smoke That Shit in Hunter's Point. And that's this was before Mr. C. So from that, I decided to actually do real production. And um, Budweiser introduced me to TC. And uh, I tried to go to the studio with T. Lowe. And T. Lowe was just kind of like, he was like our ice cube in the neighborhood. He was real dope. Uh, he was more popular on, on the mixtapes that we was putting out. Uh, the little demo tapes we had put out. 
he was like the popular one, you know, put more bigger than Budweiser, bigger than my brother Dre, bigger than me. I just had the one song, but T-Lo was real popular. So I tried to go to, uh, to the studio with him and be, become a group with him. And um, we was actually, it was called the Hit Squad at the time. So I asked him, he um, he didn't want to go with me. He kind of shot me down a little bit. He was just like, oh, you know, uh, this girl I messed with, her brother rap, that's all he do. You know, I could bring him up here. You can see how he go. You know, that's all he do, bro. I think y'all, he'd be a good fit. So he ended up bringing the, the guy up there, and it was Mr. C. And uh, for sure, he came up there. We did a song called, I want to see how he sounds. So I produced this beat, and uh, we made a song called Hit Squad New Jack. And uh, man, he dropped a whole bunch of metaphors and punchlines, and I was just like, "Oh, this dude, dope. like, okay." I said, "I could work with this." And um, yeah, from there we uh, tried to go start producing with TC, starting to make the album. And uh, when we on, the, on and while we doing all this, uh, we found out that EPMD, Eric Herman and Paris had a, a a crew called the Hit Squad. So once yeah. they put their stamp on it, they was way bigger than us. So we had to we had to switch the name up and that's when we ended up coming uh well i didn't come up with it but t Lo gave us the name rbl uh, ruthless by law and uh i ended up switching the name and changing it to uh well i didn't switch it but i wanted to shorten it ruthless by law on the cover just seemed too long so i switched it to uh, rbl posse once i took pictures with uh some of the homies out in the neighborhood i had them take a picture with us uh, just for eye candy you know none of them wasn't really rapping up being in a group or nothing but they was just uh, there just for the eye candy on the poster, you know, because I knew if you got a group of dudes back then, I knew how NWA and the ghettos made me feel when I seen a couple of them on the covers and they was like posse'd up. It made me feel like, oh, okay, wow, them dudes is like, yeah, they they deep. They, you know, they 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 got a crew, you know. So I wanted to you was already like, you was already into like marketing and watching everybody. Oh, yeah, else. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my. That was one of my things. I always was into that, like putting together a whole album, just choreographing the whole thing from start to finish. How you play songs to where you go in the mood swing. Maybe have a start off with a mid tempo song, then you go high, you know, to a, a higher BPM song, and then you might drop it down. I, I like, I like, I like it being like on the roller coaster ride. I, I don't never play when I song uh, put my song uh, my album song format. I never put two mellow or mid-tempo slow type songs back to back. It's always up and down. I go up tempo, you know, mid-tempo, up tempo, mid-tempo or up tempo or real slow tempo, you know. I always this did is that. A, so I this is in time of cassettes, right? So you you yeah. always had that big, you always had that song right the the in, I remember back in the days you said the intermission song right before the end and then that first yeah. B song. That first B song had to be like it was Right now, it's your third or fourth song on a CD, I guess. You know, right, right. <laughs> you always mm -hmm. had your main song, and then you know this next song was usually the main sub, and then fifth maybe. But that used to be the B side, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. That's when we were doing B sides back then. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you, you got involved with uh, Mr. C. Yeah. So you yeah, know, he ended up being involved, and uh, we went to down there. We found out uh, T Lo gave us the name Ruthless by Law. Short switched it to rbl posse we went down there to tc studio and, and pretty much the rest was history we ended up making an album a lesson to be learned and uh during that process i ended up switching uh don't give me no bammer joint we don't smoke that shit on this point i switched it to don't give me no bammer weed we don't smoke that shit in the sfc because i knew we had to have sunnydale and Fillmore involved in order for uh it to take off we i knew i needed the city and only and for me to have a city i had to involve Frisco in some type of way instead of just putting Hunters Point on the pedestal because we was already mentioning Harbor Road and Hunters Point in song so it's like we need an anthem for the city and I already knew how the reaction was from to, uh, Don't Give Me No Bama Joint that was a local hit when I made that so I knew if I put the SFC in there it was going to kind of take off man, I, man trust me when, I, when that dropped I just remember like how it just dropped, and I'm just like, I went. Was this at the time when the? It had to be at the time when the uh, the record store on Oakdale was still open, right? Oh yeah, yeah, the record shop on Third, yeah, Third and Oakdale, <laughs> yeah, that was that was around, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, they I moved a, they moved a bunch of our our cassettes. 
Man, they got a lot of my money. I, tell you that. They, I, <laughs> yeah. I remember like a lot of like the NOH stuff I picked up. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I remember picking up uh, Hitman. Hitman. Uh, yeah. Oof. And I mean, and, and give me a nice little shirt, you know. So right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. Right, and then I go right down the street, get a haircut. By the end of the day, I just spent twenty bucks. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I mean, that I mean, I, I first I gotta get that. I I, I hope you got a, a. I would love to see hear that original version. But if you don't got it, I understand. Yeah, no, I got it. <laughs> I got it, but the thing is, it's on a full track, and every time I used to try to put it in full tracks, it, it played with the pitch. It, it's pitched up high, and when I try to pitch it down, it went. Um, the pitches on the old full tracks, like the Yamaha one that I had, it never worked. And like I, I don't want to buy the leases, Tascam, all of them, and it, it just never, it just never worked for some reason. So um, I still got it around here in storage somewhere. A lot of my original songs that we did back then, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to hopefully. Fine. I've seen the actual uh, full track that I had a while ago, but they wanted hell of money for. I think they wanted like six, seven hundred dollars. So I was like, "What the? What? Like, man, for I guess a full track? A, yeah, it was a collector's item or something. You know, on eBay they get they going stupid with stuff because it's. I guess they, you know, they look at it as vintage or something. So yeah, I couldn't do it though. I was just like, man, I, it ain't that serious. You know what I mean? I'm I'm cool. But now I'm I'm not beating myself up because I'm like, man, I, I actually. Grabbed it up because <laughs> yeah, I, I can't man, play them in nothing. Man, I, I, I before I moved to uh, Texas, I just I had gave away my full track player, man, I, and that was like just a full. That was just literally a, a, a upgraded full track, but it was, it was still a full track. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was still a full track. The Yamaha was pretty nice. The one I had though, it was it was pretty dope. Yeah, so so we mentioned a little bit about you know the record shop on third. You know, you, you spoke about Harbor World, Road, Big Black. Let's, let's before we get into a lot of things, let's talk about the environment of San Francisco and the, at the time in which you guys were kind of growing up, making new money or making because I'm not sure if you're making records yet that are producing money, but you know right. how. How is this environment that you're going? What what was the state of San Francisco at the time? Uh, well, it was different times. Like, what you think? Like before the music, right before, or like just yeah, growing like, up period before yeah, like, hustling, like right at the time. It, like right at that time, because I, I if I remember, man, I tell you, you know, a, young, a lot of younger people don't remember a time when we all used to play Young Blood, and we all used to go to Joe Lee and you know we all were friends there was a camaraderie at one time and then yeah, things yeah. changed and it became smaller and smaller the city is already a small place it's only eight miles long and then you yeah. add that to where we're at it's only maybe two three miles long and then you just, it gets even smaller and smaller so you know I just want yeah at the time know, um well, I, I just start from the um the time when I just started really getting in the game. When I started really getting in as far as out hustling, it was cool in Hunters Point. It was like, man, it was like a, a brotherhood. You can go anywhere in Hunters Point. You pull up uh, on Oakdale, hang out with a few dudes, you know, chilling, smoking, talking, you know, just, just talking, messing with females. You can pull up in Wellington. You drive down, you know, go through the other little uh, spots, like whether it's Lee's Corner, you drive down to Bishop, you, you hit down through Thomas and Keith, go all the way down and go to Double Rock, hang out for an hour or two. I'm talking about I spent a whole day just rolling through at this point. And that's, I've actually made a song before my album dropped called Rolling Through the Turfs of HP. That was a local hit. And I'm rolling through it all the turfs. And it was cool. You can pull up anywhere. The only places you couldn't go at the time was Hunters, I mean, was Sunnydale and Fillmore. But it moved everywhere, you know what I mean? Um, during that drug era, the crack era, I say from like 87 on up to when we made that song, uh, Bammer Weed, and, and, and did the treaty, the peace treaty, it, it was dangerous. You could you get caught going, uh, you know, crossing, trying to go to hard puts or something, and feel more trying to go get you a, a pair of shoes or something at hard puts. Uh, yeah, you get jumped or beat up, or you're trying to go down the Kaplan zone uh, downtown or going to the arcade down there. You would get beat up, you know, and um, 
even too going to Castle Lane, trying to go hang out, playing, you know, playing uh bowling, doing some bowling or something, trying to hang out with a female. Sunny though dudes pull up on you is over with, you know, and catch you at the drive in. So it was problems back then. But in Hunters Point, you were safe. It was cool. You didn't have to worry about nothing. You hang out all day and do whatever you felt like doing, driving on each turf. And um, all that stopped when we dropped the, uh, the album in 92. We actually uh, I, I reached out to uh, a few OGs, Preacher Man, and a lot of dudes over there in Fillmore. And they came over there. Them, JT, the bigger figure, a lot of them dudes pulled up on my day. You know, they trusted me and pulled up. You know, I set them up or did anything, but they trusted me. I told them, like, man, you know, I'm trying to bring a peace treaty, bro. And, you know, we we trying to bring this stuff together. And whoever got problems with each other, they can fight it out. And, you know, we can keep it moving. And they pulled up and we we did set our peace. Everybody's, man, made promises that we wasn't going to funk no more. And uh, it, we didn't. And it, it never went back to it ever since then. You know what I mean? But what happened after that was a whole new era came in. It was you know you not funking with you ain't got nobody to funk with you start fighting each other you know what i mean and yeah all of a sudden you got harbor road splitting into two you got sunnydale yeah. splitting into two you got this side against that side uptown against downtown left against right you know here against there it, it just became a split up now to where everything nowadays is clicky it's like four five man clicks like you might be on harbor but you don't mess with them dudes down there you got your four five people you deal with so it went from splitting in half now the halves to split in half to half, little half. clicks and all that. Yeah. So now it's half half. So you ain't safe nowhere now. It's like you can't trust nothing no more now. So you know, I, you know, I, I was blessed to be able to grow up in that era where I was I saw Hunters Point as a whole as Hunters Point versus yeah. just Harbor Road, West Point, and breaking down from that to a big block RBL or you know, or seven hundred block against that block or uptown yeah. against down, you know. I'm, you know, I was happy to, to witness and be a part of, of Hunter's Point. You know, I mean, that whole movement, just being together, you know, and representing the whole. So, yeah, like I say, it's just it's clicky now and it's dangerous. Because that's and, what um, I've always said. Yeah. That's what I've always said is that RBO almost, in my opinion, represented that time in which we all said, we all collectively just said, you know, this is our group, you know. Right. <laughs> you right. know, this was right. our group. He's, we're putting everybody out. They're, they're, you know, we're we're riding with these people, and you know, and I remember when, like, when Eleven Five came out, and that was like, that was like, yeah, we got another one, even though they're different, but that's another one. You know, like that was right. like the golden era. You know, Garcia. <laughs> yeah, that was our little yeah. brothers. You know. All them was yeah. in the studio with us when we was making our albums and, and this stuff. You know, we was in there doing a lesson to be like a lot of them used to be sitting around Cold World Hustlers, E Sick and all them. E Sick is actually on sort of like a cycle doing the feelings. What you gonna do that shit for? Lay your punk ass on the floor. You know, he we are they all was in there, whether it was dudes from like UDI or uh Cold World Hustlers, eleven five before they all became groups. TC used to have all them in the studio. We, they was just be hanging out, drinking and smoking and and chilling, you know, and um, yeah, it was just togetherness, man. And they got we motivated a lot of them, you know. After RBL came, that's how you know a lot of three letter groups came RTD, uh, uh, you know, you had the GRPs, the GLPs, the you know, everybody yeah. started, you know, a lot of them acronym groups came, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was cool, you know, we, we loved it, you know, we respected it, and uh, we, we set it a trend, and a lot of them dudes, uh, even to this day uh you know they were they respect us they put us on the pedestal you know what i mean and they let us know how much we meant to them even jt to this day bro, you showed me how to press up my first cd you know I me mean? my first cassette bro i love you for that you could have hated and be like nah he can feel more i ain't showing him nothing but i showed him how to get it and he ran with it and you know he was on the go after that putting out yeah. tape cassette after cassette you know me and him rolled out there to music annex showed him what to do and he made it happen that's the way that's the way i think you know a lot of men we need to get back to is when we're sharing our gifts and then you know we're able to like make the community better because essentially what you did was you helped another five ten people and he's helped and by you helping him he's probably reciprocating that to you and we need to kind of exactly. get back to that so yeah, uh yeah. you know obviously you know 
with the death of Mr. C's hitman, you're technically the last one. How do you deal with the death, and how do you have to can to can you how, what kind of faith are you having right now to where you continue on? Because, like I said, we spoke about the history, we spoke about the environment, but it's easier for people just to like walk away, wallow in sorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, just be like, man, I had my chance, man. It it all went bad. But, you know, out of, out of everything, you've always kept the head up. You know, you kept on putting CDs yeah. out. You keep on projects. You keep on doing things. What? Yeah. What, what, man, my family, you speak to the you know, my, my kids. You know, my, my, my family and my kids won. And, and I did definitely know I was blessed. And um, I do believe uh, in a higher being, a higher spirit, you know, um, I don't really necessarily go to church and nothing like that. I don't believe you have to uh, go to church in order to have a relationship to, with God. You know, as long as you have faith and you believe, you know, Jesus was here and you believe there is a higher being, I believe that's all you really need. I don't have to actually go inside a building because it got a cross on it in order to, you know, to feel like, um, you know, you, you believe or whatnot or, or, um, that you're saved or, or whatever they might say, you know, um, yeah. I always had, 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 had faith in my family. You know, we, I grew up in a Baptist church over there in Philly. My grandmother, you know, rest in peace. She, she made sure we stayed going to Sunday school, you know? So I always believed that, you know, I was definitely blessed, especially when I got into this music, it's the way everything turned out and, you know, just how all the, um, just just things doors start opening you know what i mean once i got off the ranch and i just how uh, Budweiser led me into the mu music just kind of just distracted me from the streets from being out there gang banging and, and doing all the dumb stuff to causing a peace treaty saving lives at the time you know I, I always knew i had a purpose so it was just one of those things where you know um you know it's it just that you gotta wake up and see it because some dudes be blind you got them blinders on and you know you just out there in the streets and you and you and you passing by missing your opportunities and your gifts you know you'll get caught up and me you know man I, like i said my daughter man she was one of the ones that kind of softened me up i'm glad i had a girl first um <laughs> man you know because if i had a little boy you know because in, in the hood sometimes we have little boys we treat them like they pit bulls you want them to be tough you want them to be the, you know the toughest dude coming up under you you know that's little chris and he got to act like me i want him to be yeah. tough i don't want him to get punked up well, with the girl, it was different. You know what I mean? It, 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 it was about... And trust me, I get it, man. I, and, and yeah, you know, she softened I got a up, little so. girl. I got a little girl now. I am a, I am a total softy. Like, yeah, man. It, it, I, it was different, man. I went from uh, Black Chris to Black C, the rapper, and just, you know, just being the father. And Black C is totally different than, than Black Chris. I mean, I was out there stupid. And uh, yeah, my daughter, man, I... She she was one of the key per people, you know. I mean, after losing Mr. C and all, and then I, you know, kind of looked at her, and just like, man, I gotta. I went in the shell for a couple months and just ready to give up music, everything. All I was thinking about was just revenge. I was just thinking evil thoughts. I just had that devil on my shoulder, just like these dudes disrespected you. Everything you did for that hood, you didn't, you know, you know, fought for dudes. You know, stood out there on the front line for that neighborhood and these dudes just do you like and, and that was just playing over in my head and i had to wash that out and put all that energy towards music man and um that's what i did i just like man let me direct all this energy i got into music and that just became therapy to me at the time making songs you know i made a bunch of songs getting off a lot of stuff off my chest about how i felt about certain dudes who i felt betrayed me and and just about the whole situation, you know, and that's what I for an eye would be about. Just like, okay, we ain't trying to go get an eye for an eye on the streets. I'm feeling like success is the best revenge. Once y'all see me on this TV getting played nonstop, nonstop, and I put that big old billboard on Third Street looking down on y'all, I think that's going to make you feel some type of, and that was my goal, you know what I mean, just to make them feel like, man, we could have been a part of that. Now we not, you know what I mean? So. That was just, the, that's what I fed But, but you had of. faith in yourself that it was going to be better. Like, you know, you didn't oh, yeah. stay definitely in that spot. Did. Oh, yeah, I definitely did. I already, I seen the light at the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel. I was just like, man, you know, I'm going through this darkness right now, but there's definitely light at the end of this tunnel, man. I, you know, I just got to stay focused on my path. Don't get, uh, you know, redirected. 
don't get unfocused and don't start directing energy you know I, I just started surrounding myself with positive people too positive energy you know I, I just had to get rid of that negativity just so i don't get distracted and go off course and because the worst i mean the only thing that's gonna happen was i was gonna be doing 25 to life which nobody's gonna be helping my daughter out none of my kids and uh you know i was in the process of buying this home i mean i had a lot of things going for me you know what i mean to where yeah. i'd have been stupid to just throw it all away over trying to make some dudes pay for something where you know mr c wasn't gonna come back you know what i mean it would no matter what i did he wasn't finna show up at the studio the next day you know what i mean so i had to focus on my kids and my kids needed me more than anything so you know, nobody so yeah I, I just like man like you said I, you know just kept the faith stayed prayed up you know my mama stayed praying for me we did a lot of praying back then and um even to this day we still do but back then it was it was she stayed she stayed coming over to me praying with me um you know then we have son call me up let me pray for you you know show up let me pray for you and you know that just did something to me to where i, I didn't fall off course and um i'm here today and blessed you know with the opportunity to still be dropping music yeah yes because um you know not to i mean i appreciate everything you just said and i i don't want to take it too too off the subject, but uh, I remember you guys had a deal with, you mentioned Eye for an Eye. Was that under Atlantic? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Big Beat and, Atlantic Records. Yeah, how long did, and, and was that the last one under Atlantic? Because I, I, gosh, I want to say there was Yeah, one we only did one. We only did one. We started bumping heads because what happened was uh, we signed with Atlantic Records uh, through this guy named, um, uh, not Mike Karen, but, um, oh man i forgot his uh uh the, the he the president now at atlantic records i can't believe i'm having a uh, brain farts right now on his name but he the guy the original guy that scientists ended up leaving and when he left he put us with this dude named mccarran who he was dealing with and uh he was with us on the first album and you know he signed me he was like black i still want to do the deal we know you lost mr c i know you're the man behind the music let's you know let's keep it going i want to have you you know put out uh, just bring Hitman in. I know he can't take the place of Mr. C, but just want you have him come in just to kind of fill some of the void. And I'm like, all right. And um, we went on and did the deal. But as soon as we did the deal, he ended up leaving and got a bigger position at Atlantic Records. So he wasn't uh, like a and r and, and working with the groups no more. So he put another dude in place to work with us. And we just didn't see eye to eye, to eye because he was pretty much uh, uh, East Coast. He was into like more of that backpack rap, boom bap type stuff. And we was more like, you know, funk, mob, or whatever you want to call it. And yeah, uh, that's it just didn't we, work out. Just to, just to let everybody know, you know, San Francisco has a unique sound. We combine, you know, a lot of blues, funk, you know, yeah. jazz. There's, it's, it's a Why very that? unique sound. It's a, there is a Bay Area sound, but everybody knows at 90s. Uh, exactly. A 90s Hunters Point, or I, I wouldn't say Hunters Point, but just a 90s San Francisco music. We we have a unique sound, and uh, I can understand yeah. how, especially because of, I want to say the Loonies were, I don't know, that would be, yeah, that would be around the Loonies, right? They they had came out with I Got Five on it. but Yeah, they I came think, out after us around 93, 94, something like that. They came out around 90, 94, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I... They, there's there's a, there's a line in which you know a lot of the East Coast producers and and a lot of the East Coast people were sw soaking up a lot of our artists, but they were trying to really change the music. I, from what I could tell, you know, I was never a musician, but right. for me buying the for me buying the music, I could tell. You know what I mean? That's how it was going on. So uh, yeah. So you know, what could people learn from the RBL story? Because you know. You could you could you hear about though you hear about young men trying to make it and then you hear about them all going to jail or death. What is the RBL story? Is what I, I guess what I want to hear. Um, it's a story of jail, really, and um, you just can't you know everything ain't never what it seems. You know, you just gotta uh, just just really man, just if you got a tight circle, keep it tight. 
And you know, really, man, just don't try. I don't. I don't trust nobody with family right now. I got a real small circle of friends. It's so small. It's, that circle so small. It's a dot, like Drake say. It's really not to me. You know, I got a bunch of business associates, but I don't really. You know, that that really woke me up to where it's like it's hard to let people in now. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm yeah. glad I got a big family now. I got a bunch of nephews and nieces, and you know, uh, my kids and. Um, where I don't really have to venture out when it's time to go camping and go and do something. It's my family. I'm blessed to have a big family. My father had uh, 17 of us, and we we deep. You know, we just we all got different moms. A lot of us, but it's three with my mom. You know what I mean? But yeah. we all know each other. My father made sure we all knew each other, and we stayed in touch with each other. So we all got nieces, nephews, and uh, so. We ain't got to go outside the circle too much no more, you know, because uh, like I said, I did a lot of stuff for dudes in that neighborhood. And in the end, it was a lot that went on, man. It was just, you know, just and it ended with the death, of ultimate betrayal. So our story is just, you know, it's just really. Uh, and I got a book coming out talking about all that, you know, okay. I, I, I got more of a deeper dive into it. It's going to be out later this year. It's called uh, Black Sea, uh, a part of survival from the block to the booth. And I'm actually mm-hmm. releasing the uh, book cover next week just to uh, and start gonna start releasing some probably some chapter teasers uh, later on this year too also but uh yeah that's that's gonna, gonna drop uh, next week so yeah it's, it's just you know man uh, just 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 pretty much you know keep your circle small and, and, and just watch who you're around with surroundings you know what I mean that's all and yeah. uh, also Make sure you read contracts and stuff like that, because we all it's just it's, like I say, it's just a story of betrayal. Even the record label, as many records as we sold, we had we didn't get paid nothing. You know, we sold hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of units. It should have been, you know, nice. We should have had money in our pocket. And uh, even Mr. C, he probably would have never been out there trying to hustle if we'd have got our royalties checks from Intermittent Records, but they refused to pay us due to the samples. And yeah. we knew the money. We had the money. We we had the money from the second out. We we had the sales in, but Jason was just on drugs. And you know, when you're dealing with a drug addict who's a you know who's the, the CEO of the label, I mean, what you expect, you know? So yeah, like I said, we learned man. a lot. You know, man, that sounds like a movie, play. bro. That sounds yeah, like a it's movie, definitely man. gonna be one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's right, definitely man. one. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, you, this is a lot of my childhood, and I'm just like I'm, I'm seeing it before my eyes, and the little words that you're saying are like popping up. I'm like, oh man, I forgot about that. Yeah, so you know, yeah. you know, but uh, what I want to do is, you know, basically, like I said, I, I want to, you know, the music is one thing, you know, the, the the glamorization of a lot of things are another thing, but the one thing that I, I wanted when I created this channel was to create a channel about faith and create Mm -hmm. something that my daughter could definitely look back and see that, you know, his father at least tried to bring out faith and spread the message of it. You know, let's, I start having a stereotypical question. What does faith mean to you? And it doesn't have to be long, but what is it when somebody says the word faith, what does that mean? Um, like just, believing like you know having faith meaning just like um believing in something like if you got a a goal you have the faith that you're gonna get there just believing you're gonna you know get to whatever you know from point a to point b you know that's what faith mean to me just believing that's really what it is to me. basically just sum it up in word one word just believing and how can men use that to overcome like their issues because you you talked about how you 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 were going down through it, but how could other what could another man or more specifically young men use it? I would say just believe that it's uh believe in having a positive outcome. Like if you have a problem with a dude, believe that the problem could be fixed. And some dudes just be it's like no hope with the younger man. He killed my man. I ain't trying to man. I don't trust them dudes. It's like bro, you got to just believe that. It, I mean, what you gonna do is just gonna tit for tat all day till you kill him. Okay, now you gotta go ahead and kill one of his partners, and he gotta come kill one of your. It's like when is it gonna end? You know. So you got to believe and just and trust that, trust the process that is. You know, man, if you come to the table, we can actually you know get some good results. You know, resolve it. And um, and that's really what it's about. Just 
just having faith that it can happen, you know, instead of yeah. being negative all the time. A lot of times they just be negative and it can't happen, man. I don't, this, this ain't going to happen, bro. I'm telling you, man, these youngsters, and I ain't trying to deal with them. They, I, I just, they just don't believe. They have no faith. So yeah. I just, I, I feel like it's just believing in the process and just trusting it. And, you know, a lot of like how that, like I said, the, 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 the Filmo dudes, when I called them over, they trusted me. They had faith that something happened. That this can yeah. end. So and they came over and look what happened. Feel more sunny. I, I feel more comfortable and sunny than I feel more than I done this point. You know, yeah. behind what I did back then, it was it was fine for years, all the way up to the point of Mr. C gone from ninety two to ninety six. The city was cool. It was really no problems around there. You know, you might have a few dudes who bump heads and you know kill us, but it wasn't no war, no no gang wars. No turf splitting up. All that stuff happened, I, I believe, from the death of Mr. C. Everything started going sideways in 96. And it ain't been the same since. Man, I, I hear you, man. And, and I hope that a lot of people will take the message and take heed of that message. Because, like you said, it's if you don't believe in the positive, you don't believe in the order in which God has put you on this earth for, that you're not here just for death and destruction and disease. You're here for a reason. You know, that's mm -hmm. my message that I want people to know is that if you have faith in that reason, that reason can get revealed to you. And it come, it may not be the way that you want to, you know, but it's going to be in a way that God will always promise you the gifts. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, that, yes, you know, I appreciate, like, I appreciate you do, uh, talking about that. Uh, you know, the legacy of RBL is, you know, has always been, you know, no matter what, you're going to hear, don't no, give me no Bama weed at least one time <laughs> in any party, any dance from, I don't care if it's right. middle school dance, I don't care where it's at, you're going to hear, don't give me no Bama weed. Bluebird is, a, is, you know, I don't care what anybody say, everybody knows Bluebird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. There's a Bluebird over Bluebird there. Bluebird and Bama weed, yeah, are two yeah. top, top hits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whip. How are you taking the legacy for? What are you what are you doing in terms of taking the music forward? Um uh, you know, steady doing music, you know, besides that, you know, I'm doing a lot of other things, joint ventures, uh, with cannabis. Uh we got cannabis projects that we do joint ventures with with Sunset Connect. We did a joint venture with Buddy Bud uh Reserve, San Francisco Reserve. Uh, where well, we got our roofless strands uh, going on, we got a roofless by law strand going on with Sunset Connect, and um, we also doing licensing deals. We doing a bunch of stuff. I did with skateboard companies like FTC. We did a joint venture with So Fresh Clothing. We did um, a, a skateboard deal with Quartet Skateboards. Um, we did something with Thrasher. You know, did li licensing deals with them. So it's things like that that um, keep the torch lit. Uh, Mr. C and them, also the RBO name, you know what I mean? And um, and I believe that uh, this book, these albums that I put out going on my solo uh, uh, adventure, doing what I'm doing on my solo career, I think all that is just contributing to the whole RBO legacy. And, um, and, I, and I take it real serious. I try to make sure we don't have no flaws on it. I try to keep the quality control as if it was, the CNN was still here. And, uh, you know, I don't do no cornball stuff to, you know, to make them look bad as far as even right now, I'm putting out animated videos and stuff to try to keep even keep them out there. You know, we uh, released because back then videos used to cost like uh, maybe like 20, 30,000 back when Mr. C was alive. Just a Bama Week video, you know, as cheesy as it looked, you know, it looks all right, you know, but. That video cost us like twenty some thousand. Now they did a real crispy, clean four K video for like five hundred dollars. So now I'm bringing them <laughs> yeah. back, you know. So we only did one video off each album back then. So now yeah. what I decided to do is go back, revisit those albums, and bring me and him and Hitman back as animation characters. So that's what I've been on. That's the hype I've been on. I'm about to release uh, also uh, Hitman uh, song, The Funk. Hopefully next, not not next week, but maybe week after next, because uh, I'm, uh, next week is the release of my album, so I don't really want no distractions leading up to that release or in, a, in a record release party I'm having. So 
I'm going to um, put that out, put it out the week after. And um, yeah, we just got animation videos coming to keep my boys alive and keep the torch lit for this RVL thing. Okay. So, and you mentioned that you, like you said, other than your book, you're coming out with a new album. You want to talk about that? Yeah, the album is titled Black Sea. And um, the title is just me, myself, just, just basically, you know, a lot of dudes start calling me that. I got the name from the Black Exploitation film, um, you know, from uh, back in the days. And, uh, you know, and also it's, you know, it's based on Black Caesar the Pirate. And, um, you know, I just started doing a little research on that. And, you know, I kind of liked it, his story, the, the Black Caesar, the, the Black Pirate that used to hang out with uh, old Redbeard and stuff. So. Uh, and um you know it's just one of those things where you know i just felt like it just fit this is just it's just basically this is black sea black sea is a self-titled pretty much and uh like after from here on you know what i mean moving forward is, uh me starting on my own legacy as a solo artist so and a uh, nice production on there it was dropping august 20th streaming on all platforms uh we got a new single out right now one of the hottest artists out of San Francisco, Larry June, and uh, it's called What's Happening, and uh, it's doing good. It's doing numbers right now, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I'm in a good space right now, and uh, music is back fun again, and uh, yeah, I'm just just actually just taking advantage of it. Okay, well, like I said, man, I appreciate you coming through. You know, your message, like I said, is always. Whether you like to believe it or not, you've carried a lot of young men across the water. You know, uh, this, uh, I remember, like I said, picking up a lot of your albums. I remember the NOH, the compilation. Yeah. I, I don't, you yeah. know, I remember a lot of the stuff. So, you know, your message, your story has always been a legacy. And I'm glad you came here and talked about it. But not only that, you talk about the future because your story doesn't end. You know, your story definitely hasn't ended. And you're right, definitely right. respected in a lot of different ways. So I appreciate you taking the time out. You know, good luck on all the things that you do. Bless your family and all that, okay? Man, yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. All right, any last words you want to give? Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, shout out to uh, all the youngsters trying to get in this music game. You know, stay focused. You know, do it out of love. Don't do it trying to get paid. The money will come later on, you know, we'll do it out of love. And uh, rest in peace to Mr. C and Hitman. And, uh, yeah, we're going to keep this torch lit. And also, you know, uh, we got merchandise. Follow us uh, uh, on Instagram at RBL Posse. And uh, check out the website. Check out the store, www.rblposse.com. Click that store link and uh, get you some of them no banner tees and stuff. Got new prints coming, too, for the 30th anniversary. Our 30th anniversary is next year, so we got a bunch of stuff. I got a bunch of new designs that uh, I'm about to start. They're going to start. Well, I'm, I'm going to actually debut some at my record release party next week. But uh, you'll see a bunch of designs starting to pop up on my page. And uh, they'll be for sale yep, for the 30th anniversary, man. 30 years in this game. Can't believe it. Yeah. And I'll put all the information on the bottom of my the description of my uh, of the video. Uh, follow all their pages. If you haven't already, I'm. <laughs> follow everything that they have uh, also be on the lookout for the book because I'm ready to read this book you know this is yeah. I am ready so you know I appreciate you coming by thank you once again you know yeah much love man and there we have it you know Black Sea has an amazing story you know he really shows you what perseverance goes through you know, having faith in yourself, using that faith to maneuver in the world in which is not always favorable to you. And it's not always going to be uh, sunshine in every place. Sometimes you got to be smart and you got to see through the clouds. Um, but also, you know, be a man, stand up, stand tall and make your own legacy and continue the legacy because your faith has a matter for everybody you're involved with. Thank you, guys. Like I said, like, subscribe, hit the bell. We'll see you on the next one.